Photography has always fascinated me growing up. To me, it's the closest thing to magic at a young age. I mean, simply just point and click your camera and you have a memory captured in the physical state. But how? How does opening a simple shutter, gate, or hole on the sensor for fractions of a second produce an image? I mean, when I open the door or window blinds to a dark room, it doesn't produce an image in the room on the opposite wall, does it? Film and cameras use photosensitive or light sensitive elements and chemical reactions to capture an image. And if I'm being honest, thinking chemistry was magic as a kid wasn't so far off. Film consists of multiple layers, most importantly the emulsion layer which contains silver halide crystals and a gelatin substance. When you go to take a picture with film, the camera opens the shutter, letting the light which exposes the photosensitive silver halide crystals in the film, creating a latent image in the emulsion layer of the film. You then roll the film to your next shot, placing the exposed film in the dark until you're ready to develop. It's in the development process that that latent image is then amplified by a developing agent and then fixed so that the film is no longer light sensitive. What remains is a photo negative, which you can then develop or print to get digital copies in some cases. Destin from Smarter Every Day did a deep dive into the entire filmmaking process and goes into way more detail on the life cycle of photo development with the team from Indie Film Lab. I'll leave a link in the description for that video. I am only going to focus on the Brownie Hawkeye itself because while film may be magic, I'm looking to demystify the engineering of this artifact from the past. Film may be using chemistry to capture an image, but the basics of my darkroom analogy are not far off from what's actually happening inside the camera. The slight difference is the amount of light we are letting in and through how large of an aperture. There's an experiment and a device you can make called a pinhole camera. A lightproof box with a small hole on one side. Light passes through the aperture or the hole and projects an inverted image on the opposite side of the box, which is known as the camera obscura effect, in Latin meaning dark chamber. The size of the image depends on the distance between the object and the pinhole, or your focal length. Now because the light rays travel in straight lines, the image on the other side of the aperture, or the hole, will be inverted. Modern cameras use this exact principle with a convex, or converging lens, and concave, divergent lens, or a combination of both to manipulate the light rays in order to record and focus an image. Taking this knowledge, let's see how it applies to the engineering of the Brownie Hawkeye. This is the flash version of the Brownie Hawkeye, as you can tell from this monster lamp attached to it. Variations of this camera were sold from 1949 to 1961. The idea of the Brownie Hawkeye was a minimalist design camera at an affordable price for the masses. These would retail for around $7 or $85 in 2022 and $4 or $49 in 2022 for the flash unit add-on. For this video, I'm not going to spend too much time with the flash lamp, mainly because I wasn't able to find a suitable bulb or battery pack to operate it. It also doesn't help that the battery reference for it is not really made anymore and looks like a tiny explosive. The body of this camera is a simplistic box design featuring a strap-on to carry the camera atop of the latch which seals the camera together, a film shot status window, shutter releases, and two glass lenses in the front, one that leads to the lens and one that leads to the hip viewfinder. Yes, that's correct, a hip viewfinder. Unlike your fancy new cameras today, this bad boy was held at waist level to line up your shot. On the inside of the camera, there were two sets of springs to hold the film. One on the top to place the new 620 film roll that then stretches the film across this projector style box to the bottom so that you can roll your used film onto the spare film rod and then maintain it in the dark. Within the projector housing is a camera lens which sits atop the internal camera shutter components which we'll dive into in a bit. From a camera standpoint and components within, it really is simplistic as it was intended. You load a 620 film on top, stretch it across the projector housing onto a spare rod until snug enough to wind up the film, close the outer housing, removing light from the film, and spin it until you have your first shot indicator, the 1, which looks like a capital L. From there, hold it at waist level, line up your shot, press down on that shutter for the intended shot, light passes through that shutter, hits the lens which projects it onto the film to capture your memory. You only have to spend a few minutes lining up your shot on the brownie to notice that the viewfinder isn't your typical camera besides the fact that it's held at your hip. If you're looking at a modern camera viewfinder, the image is shown exactly as your eyes would see it. For example, in this image, pencil sharpeners on the left with three hydrangeas to the right. Looking through the brownies viewfinder, we kind of see the opposite. The image is still right side up, but it's reversed left to right, mirrored, or the reflection. 
Taking what we know from before with our pinhole camera example and the different types of lenses, you can see the Brownies viewfinder takes these same concepts into effect. The image enters through a plano convex lens, hits the mirror at a 45 degree angle, and is passed to a double convex lens before it reaches your eye. I've taken the liberty to take apart the Brownie Hawkeye off camera as some of these screws are a little stripped and don't come out too easily without a little bit of mechanical advantage with the screwdriver. But testing our theory, the image that you're trying to line up with the camera should enter through two convex lenses that are on the viewfinder itself. The first is a plano convex lens, and the second is a double convex lens. There's a mirror right below the second lens that will flip the image up so that you can view it at waist level. Both converging lenses on their own are acting as I would expect them to. Light comes through the first face and converges it on the opposite end. The table is upside down or the chair is upside down in our example when we looked at it. However, because the focal point of our mirror is so close, essentially the image is coming in to the camera on the first face magnifies it, is redirected at a 45 degree angle in the mirror, and then magnified again by the second converging lens, which then hits our face above. I originally thought that the mirror was the thing responsible for flipping it left or right, but it makes sense that a converging lens is going to converge all points of light at a certain point or based on the focal point. Now, understanding the focal point is a different topic altogether. The focal point is where light rays converge on a lens or in a camera sensor. The focal length is measured as the distance from the focal point to the camera sensor. In more modern cameras, you have 28mm, 35mm, etc. Now, in the Brownie Hawkeye, I don't exactly have the measurements or the distance for the viewfinder itself, and this isn't necessarily the thing taking the picture anyway. There's another lens inside the camera that we'll get to in a moment. The main camera lens of the Brownie Hawkeye sits in the front of this projector housing and behind the camera shutter, which we'll get to in a minute. Now, unlike the viewfinder lenses, which are two converging lenses found on the top and the face of the camera. The main lens of the Brownie Hawkeye is a concave lens or a negative meniscus lens, a divergent lens, as we discussed earlier. Divergent lenses have light enter through the face and then diverge away from that lens point before it hits the film. The shutter of the Brownie is, in my opinion, the coolest part of the camera. While simplistic was the design goal of the camera, the intricate parts of the shutter appear far from simple. To me, having a purely mechanical shutter is the coolest part of this camera. In modern cameras, we're spoiled with the settings to control aperture, ISO, shutter speed, you name it. With the Brownie, all you get is a press of the button and hope that you were still, had the right ISO sensitivity film, and the appropriate shutter speed for your image to actually turn out right. This type of shutter is a rotary or a sectional shutter, meaning you have a plate with an aperture or opening that pivots around, exposing light to the lens. Most of these types of shutters have one or a few of the following features. For example, a shutter plate has to be returned to its original position after the exposure or else you risk allowing too much light and overexposing your film. So many shutters will have a secondary plate to cap the aperture as it moves into position exactly like we have here. The shutter can be retentioned following the exposure and pass across the lens in an opposite direction. A popular arrangement on simple cameras was for the spring powering the shutter to retension itself after the shutter is released. The Brownie also has a longer exposure mode by flicking up the left button, pushing a lock into place, allowing the aperture to stay open and not be affected by the tension of the springs. Putting it all together, we get this cool antique camera from the 1940s and 50s that still takes some pretty awesome pictures. As always, I hope you learned something and thanks for watching.